Good afternoon. Thank you. It's such a pleasure and honor to be here. I want to talk about two specific projects that our office is engaged in now. They're works in progress. They're at two completely different scales. But I guess I want to focus on the sentiment involved in their creation. And a lot of that sentiment is very seamlessly related to the discussion this morning. And for us, these are projects and they're kind of a, an ongoing commitment in our studio to engage with um, the context of a place and to think about adding new layers to creating a contemporary city that uh, build upon what came before in the sense that our role is to rather than restart but actually sort of recast um, many of the elements that exist and bring new life to those elements and propel them into sort of a future uh, role in the city. I think it's worthwhile talking a bit about how we came to a place where that kind of a sentiment could exist in practice. And we're fortunate because, you know, this is decades in the making in our city. And this morning, I think the, the kind of storyboard of, of the evolving city and its, its landscape and its heritage was so, uh, so stunning and, and amazing to see. I'm going to kind of brutalize it a little bit, but I mean, the physical changes that are happening in our city are tremendous, immediately obvious to the eye and expressed in the skyline. And of course, the waterfront revitalization over the last decade has been kind of one of the driving forces of that. I think what for us, um, let's say, uh, the, the sort of new generation of practitioners, what's really profound is in fact almost the mental change. No, so not just the physical, but the kind of almost change in imagination, change in collective thinking, public awareness. It's been called literacy today, and I think that's a huge part of it, of recognizing the role of landscape in building the city. And um, so, the, so the transformations on the waterfront, you know, physically are impressive, but I think the kind of mental ideas that are now um, part of the, the, the equipment of a citizen and the equipment of, of the design community is very powerful. And those, those have, have um, to do with, um, I think, optimism, as Claude, Claude's work points to, and the optimism also, I think, in, in our city that we can be a great city. It's a kind of renewed aspiration in making a city. And I think there's a sort of degree of self-confidence as, as a city as Toronto um, is emerging in this kind of amazing, exciting time where we gaining a confidence to um, actually celebrate absolutely what we have, um, to rec that there's not always this talk of what's New York doing or what's Chicago doing, but to actually embrace um, our assets and our particular qualities. I grew up in this city. I'm proud to say that I was born the same year this tower was born, which is, you know, kind of a remarkable moment. I mean, I don't remember it very well, but this was sort of the ending of that kind of heroic period of the city's growth from the 50s through the 70s, where, you know, we became metropolitan and um, many of the moves um, were absolutely mega scaled, it had to do with transportation and big infrastructure, big building. There was a kind of ambition at that time, I think, that is, I find, kind of exciting. It's sort of, you know, now obsolete, but I think it stands in opposition to maybe the sentiment that we have now, where we are actually regaining um, the same degree of aspiration and, and ambition, um, but it's expressed in different tools in terms of how we make the city. So rather than the sort of era where projects were, you know, very heroic, very much about a complete, almost a complete restart, sometimes literally, you know, where an erasure was almost seemed like the only way to then gain a future. You know, the professionals in our disciplines worked very hard to establish a role of landscape at that time, and their sort of perseverance is sort of creates the conditions now where, you know, at that time, I find it remarkable because this is a moment where, you know, as the skyline went up, parking lots appeared, and there was sort of disconnect from the ground in, in every sense. Where did our buildings go? I love this because there's sort of moments of the past that have somehow escaped a new life, and this is Guild Park in Scarborough, where there's sort of surreal monuments of that era kind of rest in a landscape. The other a very intriguing outlet, as was pointed out this morning, is the spit created sort of from the detritus of our city, which now brings us sort of back to the full circle to sort of one of the most remarkable landscapes in our city, and now you know, with Waterfront Toronto converting this into Lake Ontario Park and a whole revitalization of the waterfront, we stand in a completely different moment. A moment, I would say, you know, where parks like Sugar Beach suggest this amazing new relationship that we can have and kind of friction between the old and the new, where the participation is much more overlapping. Projects like the Brickworks, Underpass Park, where these new layers actually find themselves bringing life 
to heritage or to existing structures, below structures, above structures in the rail path, and ultimately bringing a kind of sense of public life back to the city through these initiatives. So these are the conditions in which our practice, public work, works. We founded the office three years ago in collaboration together with my partner Adam Nicklin in the studio, we work with this kind of sentiment in mind of how we might make a link between the old city and the new city, this, um, and this kind of drives our work. So I want to illustrate that hopefully through two projects, first in the Portlands. And when we talk about Toronto, often there's this discussion of this great city of neighborhoods. And that is absolutely the case. The Portlands, those cities, you know, express themselves by their ethnicity, the diversity, and often that you know, it comes to life in the streets, uh, in the public realm. The Portlands are entirely different altogether. I mean, this is a completely different kind of neighborhood. And in fact, it's never been talked about as a neighborhood, obviously. It's, uh, it's just been talked as a kind of blank territory, and it's enormous. It's the size of downtown. And, you know, it has this amazing monumental space, and it's very active. It still remains an active port, although that is transitioning and there are huge pressures for development in this area. And interestingly enough, the work of the waterfront is just sort of off the page here. It's just beyond the lower Donlands. There's a huge you know, area just beyond the picture that is actually a kind of major topic. And the city's been working hard to forge a vision as strong as some of the thinking that's gone on in the central areas of the waterfront. And we were fortunate to get involved within a process of actually that was a transportation and servicing master planning project, an environmental assessment project that we, we brought, were brought on to um, bring a layer of urban design um, visioning and work with um, the city and their partners at Waterfront Toronto and TRCA and the stakeholders to think more broadly about the quality of the public realm in the future Portlands and define an actual design framework and vision. So this is such a striking place and even if you're from this city, you, you, you almost have to go there on the ground to explore it to remember how incredible it is. It's kind of like poetry and drama of this sort of pioneering situations of growth and the scale and texture that you never see in the city and it's sort of right at the base of our city. And what's especially remarkable to us is that in some ways this area is somehow under threat with the best intentions of almost kind of becoming again a kind of a more generic place. And rather than looking at this as a blank slate for f development, we um, felt it really important to begin a discussion about how actually what was there and how it actually could retain, it has a context that's quite distinct and how that could actually be the building block for what a future urbanism and public realm could be there. And of course, as the most obvious and, and fundamental level, how to ensure that water plays a significant role in that. I mean, this is really where the city meets the lake in a powerful way. And already the work of MVVA at the mouth of the Don and the estuary points to sort of the first step, which was to really engage with the river. The next step, which is the exciting next step, is to actually engage with the port. And so these are almost become these two adjacent initiatives that are both equally, I think, powerful and deserve the attention of the city to actually bring these two heritage landscapes back to life. The first was the natural estuary and, then, and now actually the quality of the port and how that could live on in a form of, of city. Um, we kind of began the process of, of thinking about this with the city um, by making a very simple observation. If you kind of think about the city and the ring of the outer islands in opposition to the sort of terra firma of the land, there's almost, you could say, two Torontos. The, the first being the sort of inland, interland Toronto. And the formats of that are a bit known. I mean, they're the sort of like this, they're the streets and blocks and city forms that we recognize. That outer Toronto, is something entirely different. And a trip to the islands already you know, gives a clue of that kind of totally wild kind of way of inhabiting, a different way that built form and landscape participate, a completely different kind of pace, spirit, and also um, intensity of development. In the Portlands, what kind of connects those is an interesting seam through the ship channel. And that becomes a very powerful kind of potential open space in some ways that could potentially mediate between these two worlds. And we've sort of, as a kind of provocation to begin a process, we really believe that the sort of striking confrontation of these two worlds could be extremely rich and something that's worthy of hanging on to or preserving or in, in keeping its inherent qualities intact. Because of this literacy and the engagement of the community brought about by, you know, the, the Waterfront's extensive stakeholder groups, we began with a workshop with the public. And it was a workshop that sort of prioritized place and started from the place, recognizing that, as I think Paul Bedford said this morning, there's only one waterfront and there's only one Portlands. It's the one and only. There's so many sort of aspects of this place that are exceptional 
and that are exceptions to the rule, that are completely unlike any other part of the city, that we began the two-day session with a boat tour. And we actually went on the canal to sort of recalibrate people's perception of the place and not looking at it as aerial photos or maps, but actually engage with this landscape. The following are pictures that people took from the starting points for the workshop. I'm just going to click through them because they're sort of remarkable. We went in the Hearn, unbelievable. And then we got back in this room and kind of absorbed these kind of incredible collection of places and began discussions, as you somehow maybe would typically, about uh, best practices around the world and how, you know, thematically we could talk about, you know, very important aspects of the public realm design, about streets, about water's edge, about built form, about ecology, about programming, about activation, about a whole a slew of issues. And we, we looked together at about a thousand images of the best things from around the world. But we did so not in a sort of, I don't know, not in a generic way, but in a way that actually was through the lens of what we had just seen that morning. So it was through the lens of saying, actually, how is it relevant? How are these examples relevant given what we've just seen? Um, so really trying to get a conversation um, with the group about um, what this new lens might provoke and the sort of yielded this kind of collection of ideas that clustered together under a number of themes. We're kind of immersed in these thinking that were then documented in a report, you know, this whole slew of, of topics that we could take away and over the next few months begin to sort of chart a plan and a plan that actually would use the exceptions of this place or the exceptional aspects of the place as their starting point. So we began from that session, we had mapped all these remarkable features. Some of those features were remnants, industrial kind of ruins, buildings that are just unbelievable, like the Hearn power plants. They were pioneering vegetation that had reached a kind of quality that was so significant that they had a presence. Um, they were aspects of a certain dock wall, a bridge, various things. And those became actually mapped and spatialized. Of course, there was a whole slew of forces that are governing the kind of reality of the place that also was another layer to, um, to, to turn, so this wasn't a fictional exercise. There was a huge emphasis on actually the role of streets and how the streets through a transportation master plan and a servicing master plan could actually be fundamentally the most significant tools to transform the identity on an urban level and set a kind of very clear framework for this place to develop. So we articulated three very strong east-west systems, two of them streets, commissioners and Unwin, and the other the shipping channel itself as the sort of primary core structure of this place. And then in conjunction, a series of these six streets that would serve as a kind of stitches to the city. And that these two structures would effectively could create the kind of framework basically for thinking about a public realm. And interestingly, when we start to look at each of those as lines or as, as systems, and we looked again at those remarkable exceptions, when we looked at each line as a system itself, these would start to find their place within the line. This is commissioners leading from the estuary work of MVVA. So this is commissioners, which is a street that connects the lake through the estuary, through the heart of the Portlands and touches the shipping channel, where a number of ideas out of the charrette would inform how that would start to get more robust and could be reinforced, that effectively kind of create a kind of diagram about a public realm linear open system that would move from this remarkable open space that MVVA has planned at the estuary via the high street of the Portlands of commissioners with the community facility at its core and culminate in the turning basin that's seen not as just an edge but actually as a a place as a 14 acre park, so to speak. This could be the kind of counterpart to this incredible landscape, but they would, of course, have a completely different atmosphere experience. And because the focus was on influencing the EA to begin to really get specific about the quality of the streetscapes. So how the house commissioners could actually have an identity built upon these incredible hydro towers that were decommissioned and that those could be aligned within what would be a linear stormwater channel that would also be an amenity that could be linked to the public realm on the asymmetrical section where the, where the LRT would run that would continue into the lower Donlands that continues that alignment along commissioners and create a street that would be the anchor and a significant kind of public zone of movement. 
the shipping channel has its own amazing elements, which you know were explored similarly. Start to think about built form edging that engage the water, how that could vary along its length. I'm going to go through kind of quickly a, a number of these. Unwin and the, this presence on the edge, of this sort of touches Lake Ontario Park. It's almost the feeling that you get to the very edge of the city. And there's this incredible, wild, uncultivated feeling south of, of Unwin. To actually frame that in a street design that could accommodate this kind of otherworldly quality, integrate the existing rail lines with a new trail, and think about stormwater in a powerful way that can be visible and also reinforce this edge landscape condition. And when you put those three together, you start to get the beginnings of a kind of structure of like incredibly well-connected open spaces and movement through the public realm of streets. When you add then the six north-south city connection, it gets even more rich. And this is sort of a way that the thriving city neighborhoods to the north can get connected to the lake by this area. And one of the big key ones is Broadview. It's one of the streets that goes all the way north of Bloor. And at one end, you know, has this incredible panorama over the city, and at the other end could actually terminate in a bridge across to the Hearn. And so the alignment of Broadview is very important, how we could set up relationships with the street alignment to actually see the stack and to create those kind of future conditions. Cherry is an exceptional street. It takes you to a beach. It takes you to an incredible beach. And so to foreshadow that beach, we created a cross-section uh, profile that it would include a linear park that actually took a fragment of the beach and pulled it up all the way north of Unwin. So you arrive at the beach with this already this sense of, wh of where you're going. And along Don Roadway, which would go adjacent to the plans for the estuary, how the street of Don could be profiled to engage in this way. Here's the cross-section, which also anticipates the future LRT, which creates a generous esplanade walking area along this unbelievable new park that will be created here with incredible uh, sort of views across the park into the lake where you know, you'll get these unbelievable sunsets and that that becomes kind of one of the primary most sort of important civic north-south streets. And then the others are often very just sort of hardworking streets that get defined and to create a kind of robust uh, network and it produces a kind of overall structure plan. And completing that picture involves um, thinking about the scale and grain of, of the fabrics and, and the communities that could stitch into this. And that's a, a task that I'm not going to go too far into, but you know, studying how you could create grains of blocks that could be legible and distinct and to actually think of the skyline along the shipping channel as something that's composed and that's flexible enough to handle various uses that start from employment and start to transition over time. But aware about, you know, the scales of a city and the textures and the legibility of city districts, this is a huge area that, like in Toronto, already there's a sense of sort of multiple scales and could we expand these kind of clear districts within the Portlands so it's not treated as one kind of homogeneous fabric but actually has very clearly articulated districts within it and studying blocks, and which raises sort of these exciting questions of how neighborhoods like Dumbo could come to life in relationship to their infrastructure, which almost gets rediscovered, these new relationships. And you start to wonder, like, how, as the Portlands evolves over the next 50 years, even 75 years, will these remnants, which, you know, have been overlooked in the past, that those could actually be highly integrated within a new kind of city form. And so, more and more in this case, we're seeing the city as how it gets fluidly connected by water, by streets, by a public realm that really speaks to this topic of how the glue is truly sort of this public layer.